I got up and ran to the door and then the lady screamed at me, like, wait, wait, there's one thing. And I said, what is it? She said, you have to order a minimum order quantity. And then I said, minimum order quantity? How much is that? And she said, one container. I said, one container? How many fit in a container? And then she said, about 200,000 pieces. <laughs> and uh, so I said, okay, I got a plane to catch. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. I'm Jamie, and this is Clever. And today we're talking to Jan van der Land. He's the founder and CEO of design brand Kickerland, and you definitely know Kickerland. They make those quirky, clever gifts and design items that you find in boutiques and museum gift shops all over the world. You know what I'm talking about. The ones that make you smile and invite you to play. Like the Critter Wind-Up Toy or Solar Queen, the solar-powered queen of England that's constantly waving to you. Or maybe you've been seduced by a beautiful glass teapot, amused by a set of cat butt magnets, and impressed by a clever bottle opener all in the same boutique. That's Kickerland. It all started 25 years ago with a bike and a houseboat. And now it has grown into a global force in retail, manufacturing, design, and most importantly, delight. So let's get the lowdown on how it all came to be directly from Jan. My name is Jan van der Lande, and I live in New York City, and I'm the, uh, the CEO and founder of Kickerland Design. I do what I do because I like to do what I like to do. That's a good answer. <laughs> it, it is a good answer. It's okay. so simple. <laughs> it's simple and perfect. Like sometimes we forget the basics, right? <laughs> yeah. Do what you like. I think it's important <laughs> that you like what you do. I think so too. Your enjoyment of what you do seems to come through in the brand, but we'll talk all about that when okay. we get to that part of your story. But before we jump ahead to that, I really want to know what your beginnings were like. Like, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in the Netherlands? And what was your family like? Yeah, I was uh, born in the Netherlands in a small town close to the German border. And my mother was American and she came to uh, Holland when she was 23 so I was very young and yeah, so I basically grew up in a small town with a lot of cows and a lot of pastures and I had a lot of fun when I was a kid and uh, my uh, family was a little bit big. We were with six children and two parents and I'm number four and my mother was a good Catholic, so she had four children in four years and after me, I'm number four the after me, there were two more children. And so did you enjoy growing up in a big family with the pastures and the cows? It sounds like a sort of a bag of rascals running all around in the fields. <laughs> that sounds super fun. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. You know, it was not easy either because I had three older brothers and they would beat me up a lot. <laughs> so it made me a little tougher. And, yeah. But uh, my father was also... Uh, a businessman and so he wasn't there much so we were pretty much left alone we had lots of hobbies we worked on motorcycles and we would repair them transform them and make all kinds of stuff in one way it's great to grow up in a big family because uh, you don't get uh, controlled all the time so we were pretty much left by ourselves and also my mother being an american she was quite different than my friend's parents. We would do, do all kind of crazy things. Like uh, we would go out on a boat and go rowing and just having fun. How was having an American mother different from having a, a not American mother? <laughs> well, first of all, the language. And my friends would always make fun of my mom because uh, the way she spoke. And uh, she also uh, was different in the way that... Um, she she was very free and sometimes that didn't work so well with the conservative dutch people mm. she was once uh, arrested uh, when she was very young for wearing uh, being the first one wearing a bikini on the on the beach in the netherlands because that was not allowed wow um, but she was always very free and you know she did what she liked and she wasn't a very good cook we ate lots of peanut butter sandwiches 
Was that hard on you having a mom that was uh, controversial for the area that you grew up in? You're, you said your friends made fun of her accent and she got arrested for wearing a bikini. Or did you look up to that? Did you sort of admire her differentness? No, it actually was a, it was a lot of fun to grow up with my mom because uh, actually all my friends and my brother's friends and my sister's friends, they would usually hang out at our house because everything was allowed. So that definitely was a lot of fun. And, you know, being so close to my brothers, we were like only a few years older or younger, made us a little bit like a group also. Mm -hmm. And so like we would, you know, do things together a lot. Like I said, we would work on uh, motorcycles and cars and, you know, all my brothers and, uh, not my sister, but most of my brothers are all engineers. Actually, they are all engineers. Did that affect your creativity and your entrepreneurial spirit? Did you tend to make a lot of things up? You know, my father having his own business, in, in one way, it was very hard to, to have your own business, but there's always the threat that things don't work out. So the, uh, the stress of that would also uh, trickle down to the children sometimes. So like where my dad, for example, would say, say from, well, we may have to move out of this house and move into a small little attic with the whole family. Or at the same time, you, you also uh, admire that when, when I would go to my father's uh, business and you see like 50 people working there, like, oh yeah, my dad is the boss of all of this. So you, you admire that. Mm -hmm. The creativity, I think, is a different thing. You know, my mother was very creative and uh, she would always do things and she could draw very well. And also my father, he was uh, in his free time he would make paintings and uh, he would do a lot of drawing. He, he taught us a lot, just like on vacations and on the weekends when he was there. Did they have any expectations for you in terms of what they kind of were steering you toward career-wise? Yes, they wanted me to do very well in school and uh, get a good job when I grow up. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't do very well in school. And school was always very problematic not only for me, but also for my brothers. Maybe it was because my mother spoke uh, a different language or we were just too free or we didn't really uh, work very hard in school, I guess. Looking back, would you say you didn't apply yourself or that you struggled with the rigor or the formulaic type of education? Or how would you assess it now? Well, I don't know. We for example, I failed the first class of primary school. They couldn't teach me how to add because I didn't get uh, why one plus one was two. And actually, I still don't get it. <laughs> but I sort of accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, enough people are going to make you agree to that. Yeah. So thinking about your academic performance not being so great, but your parents wanted you to go to college and get a good job. How did that influence your decisions? I mean, what did you do after high school? Did you graduate? Yeah, I finally graduated from high school. And I was able to go to uh, agricultural school because I had a great interest in nature. And I loved, I had a little garden that I uh, attended. And basically, I didn't know what to do. And the closest thing of what I liked was just work in the garden and plant uh, vegetables and all kinds of plants. So I finished that. And as I went to uh, agricultural school, most of the uh, students are all uh, farmer sons, mostly. Mm -hmm. And while I was studying, I figured out that it's impossible to uh, become a farmer because you have to inherit a farm, which we didn't have, or marry the farmer's daughter, which there weren't many of in our class. And so I uh, differentiated into environmental studies. But when I finished my school, there were not uh, many uh, jobs. So out of our class, there were only five students that got a job and the other 20 didn't. So that's when I decided to immigrate to Australia. Oh, that's a big leap. Yeah, why Australia? Well, when I had a cousin that lived there, and she uh, 
and her husband had a farm, so they invited me. So I said, okay, I'm going to Australia. And um, I moved there and um, I lived with them for a while. And then soon um, I had enough money to, uh, to rent my own apartment. And then I bought a car and I had a girlfriend and everything was, was great. Until um, I received a letter that my father sent to me because before I went to Australia, I also applied to some colleges in the United States. And one of the colleges sent me uh, a scholarship to study environmental engineering in New York. And that was Manhattan College in the Bronx. Oh, and environmental engineering sounds like kind of a perfect mix of what you're interested in and the engineering roots of your family. Yeah, I was always very concerned about the environment. I really wanted to do something good. So it seemed like things were really going well for you in Australia. Were you hesitant to pick up and move to New York City? Or were you excited? Yeah, I was very excited, uh, even though everything was fine in Australia. But for me, there was another challenge. And I really liked to take on the challenge. So I said my girlfriend goodbye and I sold my car and gave up my apartment. And uh, I moved to New York City. But when I got here, it was a little disappointing because the school was called Manhattan College, but it was actually situated in the Bronx. Oh, they tricked you. (laughs) That was in the 80s, and it was not a very uh, beautiful uh, neighborhood. So it was a little tough in the beginning, and the study was also very tough. Uh, But I I made it through it. And um, after that, I was offered a, uh, an internship, so I thought, well, maybe uh, I stay a little bit longer. I didn't really have a plan to stay in New York. Okay. But then uh, I met my future wife, also in college. So, and after my internship, I was offered a job. So I thought, well, maybe some more work experience and I stay a little bit longer. So now I'm still here. You never left. I never left. <laughs> what was the internship? I was working for the city of New York at the DEP, it's the Department of Environmental Protection. So how old are you at this period in your life when you're working for the DEP? I was uh, about 26 years old when I worked for the DEP. Okay. And so between 26 and founding Kickerland, what transpired? Were these the transitional years that sort of helped lay the groundwork for your future path? I really wanted to start a small business and working for the city was kind of the opposite. Working for such a big organization, I think they had like 100,000 employees. So you're just a number. Mm. And I really wanted to do something different. So I didn't know what. I was also at the same time a bike messenger. I did that after hours. And I had some friends in the Netherlands that had small productions of small products that they were selling locally. And they asked me if I wanted to sell it in the United States. So that's how it really uh, started. So I didn't really have a plan or anything like that. It just, things just happened like that. So those first few products that you started importing and distributing that your friends designed, when you started doing that, how did you know? Did you just feel your way or how did you know how to do that? And and then also, after you started doing it, did you think, I'm, I'm on to something, I really enjoy this, I want to keep doing it? So my friend who created these vases, they sold very well. And then when I would go back, he would introduce me to another person. And that person would introduce me to another person. And as I was doing it, I was also reading up more about design. It was really something new for me. I didn't really know anything about furniture or, or products or, you know, or art. And I, I met some really interesting people. Uh, in the beginning, uh, I was buying little memo holders from Hello Jungarius. She was mm-hmm. just out of school. She had a little studio. And another friend was Chris Koons. He also had a small studio. This was also in the beginning of the movement of design that the Dutch design became uh, kind of popular. This before Droke and uh, before everybody. Mm -hmm. I was even buying lamps from uh, Marcel Wonders that sold very well. Wow. So so things just started. And I was going after the Netherlands. I found designs also in Belgium. I was representing some 
some Belgium designers and also some German designers. I started to go to trade shows and learn more and more about the business. So this was all a lot of fun for me. I really liked that period. So who are you selling these products to? Was it retail stores or selling them yourself? You know, I had a very good bike and a very big bag. So I would put all the products in my bag and bike around the city. And if I see a nice store, I would just go in and say, show the products. And sometimes they would buy it and sometimes they wouldn't. But I would build up a small clientele. And for example, these vases that were for my friend Rob in Amsterdam, they sold so well that as soon I had uh, every design store, every florist, I had, uh, I had my vases in there. And that's when I uh, met another person. His name is uh, Louis Dolan, who helped me a lot. He said, well, why don't you uh, exhibit at the uh, New York gift show, which is called the Action on Design. And that, that's when, I, for the first time, I was able to sell outside of New York because I pretty much saturated the whole New York with my vases. Oh, so that opened up the whole domestic market for you? Yeah, I never even heard of the, uh, that there was, the gift show was so big. That, that really changed everything. So from then on, we really had to get serious about the business. Does that still mean you biking around the city with a big bag and a bunch of products? When you have to get serious, how does that change things? Well, in the beginning, I run my company from my boat where I lived. So I had a little office in there. Um, but soon that was too small. So I rented a little office on Columbus Avenue and I had a little storage room. So then I would send everything by UPS. That was a lot easier. Did you just kind of go with the flow and make it up as you went along and, and learned like that? Or did you just like consult with people you knew on how to do stuff? Well, in the beginning, before I wanted to start my business or when my business started to grow a little bit, I felt that I needed a business plan. So I bought a book and the book was titled was How to Write a Business Plan. So I read the book and basically it said that uh, a business plan is you need to know what to do when things go wrong. So that was it. So I, I figured, okay, if things go wrong, I just start another business. Or I, I don't know. I didn't really have a business plan, but I also studied the market. And, uh, I went to, uh, there was a organization that has a magazine, HFN, and they have a library. And I would go read about the market you know, how big was the market, what products were sold in the market. And they, they were very helpful and they let me sit there and read and I could make uh, Xerox copies at that time. And, and so that's how I learned how the market is. You know, my company was always a little bit different because the, the big business in the United States is they're big corporations, big companies like Target, Walmart, and uh, that's really a, different than what I was doing. The products that we sold were not really for the main market. They were more special in the sense that they were a little bit more high-end, a little bit better designed. And, uh, but at the same time, I was always interested in, in this big market. Like, and if you would go to, uh, to a Walmart and, or Target and you look, look around the products that they sell, they're like very functional and people buy it. And they were useful, but they're very, very ugly. So I figured there's got to be a better a market for better looking products that still have the same function. And that's what we've been doing for the last 20, 30 years. Try to redesign products that are better looking and make your life better than just very functional items. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like exactly your brand mission. I, I think it's also interesting to point out that you did spend a lot of time learning about the market and putting in a lot of, you know, your own time reading up on it and riding your bike from store to store or selling products. So there was certainly something inside of you that was very determined to make this, you know, a viable business. So even though it was organic, it sounds like you really had a drive for this. And I, I actually want to ask you about the designers that you work with, because you said in the beginning, you know, you would work with a designer and then he would introduce you to another designer and another designer. Was there a point where you were like, 
okay, I want to reach out to X, Y, or Z designer and work with them. And is there a particular criteria that you look for when you choose a partner to work with? Well, in the beginning, I uh, used to work with uh, mostly self-producing designers Mm -hmm. that have a small production. And I would then ask them if I could sell their products. But later, I started to produce my own products using the designs from the designers. And that that really made the uh, business grow a lot bigger than, than it was. Is that because you could scale up manufacturing to meet demand? Yes. For example, uh, the first product that uh, we sold was the Critter. Mm-hmm. I mean, that we produced ourselves. And uh, I was with a friend of mine from the Netherlands, Dick Dunkers. He owns a design gallery in Amsterdam. And we went to some stores and then we saw the Critter, which is like a kind of a wind-up mechanism. And four little wires, and if you wind it up, it starts to walk. And it was designed by a Brazilian designer, Chico Bicaldo. And when I asked the storekeeper, well, you know, where did you get it from? He said, oh, it's from Chico, but he went back to Brazil and you cannot get it anymore because he used to make it from this uh, wind-up mechanism that he bought from Canal Surplus on Canal Street. And he used them all up. So that was the end of it. So then I asked, you know, my friend Dick Dunkers, Jan, you got to try to produce that. And uh, so we asked for the address of uh, Chico in Brazil. And then Kevin, who uh, was the shop uh, owner, he gladly gave me the address. So I wrote a letter to Chico and he wrote me back. He said, sure, if you're a friend of Kevin and, and Kevin is my friend, so we must be friends too. So he said, go ahead, try to make it. And that was the first time I went to China and I looked for seven long days for the, the factory and um, everywhere I went, they would tell me that they could make it, but nobody really had the item. Then on the last day, on a Friday in the afternoon, when my flight was going back to New York and the last factory, I walked in and I see on the shelf that little wind-up mechanism that is needed to make the critter. And the lady, the owner of the factory, um, she was very nice and uh, we negotiated a price and she said, yeah, we can, uh, we can make that, no problem. And then uh, all once I look at my watch and uh, I said, oh my God, I got a plane to catch, I got to run out. So I, I got up and ran to the door and then the lady screamed at me, like, wait, wait, there's one thing. And I said, what is it? She said, you have to order a minimum order quantity. And then I said, minimum order quantity, how much is that? And she said, one container. I said, one container, how many fit in a container? And then she said, about 200,000 pieces. <laughs> and uh, So I said, okay, I got a plane to catch. So I ran out and she made this sample for me. So when I came back two weeks later, I got the samples in by the post. And I had a small trade show in San Francisco, I believe it was. And I put the critter on the shelf. And that first day, a little man came by and he started playing with it. And I said, oh, how are you? He said, fine. It's like, nice, a nice thing. He's like, yeah, it's fun. And then um, I said, well, you want to buy it? So I gave him the price. He said, yeah, well, I'd like to buy it, but I'm not sure you can deliver. And then I, I asked him, well, why not? He said, well, you know, we have like a couple of thousand stores. He said, well, how many do you need? And he said, 200,000 pieces. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the first time we started our own production. So that, that, that's how it all started. Oh, my gosh. That is serendipitous. Who was the man and what were the 2,000 stores? Well, actually, it was uh, then was, was called the Nature Stores. And they got later uh, bought by the Discovery Channel. Oh, I remember those stores. Yeah, they, they were fun stores. They had all kinds of inventions and oh, uh, sold very well, by the way. They reordered many times. But unfortunately, they're not around anymore. That's, that's still a good concept. Yeah, and that, that for you was a, a great way to get your feet wet in the manufacturing business because you had so much success right off the bat. And so at that point, I'm guessing you decided that's the way to go. Yes. So from that moment on, we make all our products ourselves, which is uh, not an easy thing to do, but uh, we've been doing it for many years. So I guess 
we, we know a little bit about it. You know, making things is much more difficult than just selling it because uh, not only we have to uh, work with designers and come up with something new every time, we also have to uh, look for factories that are specialized in uh, different products that you're working on. And then besides that, you also have to do all the marketing for it. So we have to go do trade shows and we have to make packaging and, you know, all kind of advertising, get the idea out. And sometimes we change just like ordinary products. And, but sometimes to come up with something totally new and um, that requires a lot of work and a lot of explaining. Mm -hmm. So it's not that, that easy. No, it's a, there's an inventorship to it, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Kickerland is 25 years old now. Obviously, one of the major milestones was moving to make manufacturing all the products yourselves. Can you give us an overview of the business now? Because you're global and you're not just doing Dutch design anymore. You're doing all kinds of stuff. Give us the snapshot of what it looks like now. Well, we're situated in Manhattan, in NoHo. And we have about 50 people uh, in our office with of about half is creative. The other half is all business sales and accounting. And we have another office in Europe, in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, where we have uh, another 15 people that are also doing uh, mostly sales and marketing. All the creative work happens here in New York. And then we have a small office also in Hong Kong with six people and they do all the logistics, testing and make sure everything is up to par and there's no problems with the products. And your distribution is primarily to gift stores and museum shops and retail? Well, we also sell to bigger stores like Target and uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. Okay. And also in Europe. And online, right? Kickerland.com is e-commerce? Yes. Mm -hmm. And online we sell also, yeah. And we had a little store also in uh, the West Village. Yeah, we need to talk about that store because you use that store as a platform for not just selling merchandise, but for kicking off many of Kickerland's other initiatives. Is that true? Yeah. And uh, that was really the purpose of the store, not to immediately to make, uh, to make money and sell our products. We wanted to be uh, sort of a, an open house for, for, for local designers to give them a chance to, to sell their products to, and to work with them. And uh, we also do uh, a program that we call Conversations, where we invite uh, a designer or an architect or an artist to come. And uh, then we have some discussions and uh, we make a little party out of it. It, it, that's that's a lot of fun to interact with on a local basis because it's uh, one way that, you know we invited the design community to come over and to listen to what we say or what the designer says and maybe interact in that way also with with the public and it's not only about making money it's also about you know what we do is like to uh, educate and and tell about about good design and People really resonate to that. So along those lines, Kickerland also initiates design challenges. Can you talk about what those challenges are and why it's important to the brand? Design challenges fall in, in the same thing that where we uh, work with schools. And we have done uh, about 11 design challenges already. And not only in the United States, but we did uh, two in Korea, two in Mexico. And... One in the Netherlands. And the, the fun thing is that the same with the conversation is that every time we discover that, especially among young people, there's such an interest for well-designed products and for design. That, and to see that enthusiasm, it really works well because we ask the students to design something. And usually we take a partner out of the industry. Uh, for example, uh, last year we had a partner the container store, they're from uh, Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. So they came up with the assignment for the students, and then the students have to design something and um, being inspired by Kickerland's products. And the products that come out of that are always so much fun. In one way, we teach a little bit what we have learned in the years that we've been doing it. And then 
And so that's very good for the students and the university, but also we get very good products out of that. So that Kickerland can distribute and then usually the partner gets the products on an exclusive basis. So everybody is happy. It works very well. We continue to do that. This year, we finished another design challenge with Paper Source, which is a stationary store. And so we had some really nice stationary products to come out this year. And next year, we're going to work with an uh, outdoors store together with the uh, Design Academy in the Netherlands. So that's, uh, that's going to be a European project. So that's going to be fun too. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah, and they do sound like win-win-win situations for uh, for you, the partner, and the student. That all seems really mm-hmm. like a good way for everyone to get what they need out of it. I want to ask you, Kickerland, the brand, is kind of known for reinterpretations of the functional, as you mentioned, that are more aesthetically pleasing, but also, I mean, humor and wit and quirk are sort of big defining words i think that kickerland would be known for is humor a part of your particular recipe yeah humor is always good you know uh, i always say that we take the business very seriously but design we don't take very serious you know i I think it's uh, perfectly fine to have some humor in the products you know, life is already so serious. Like, <laughs> why can't we have a little fun? Would you say that the humor is part of the reason Kickerland's so successful? I mean, do you think it's why people gravitate and find these products so appealing? No, I think Kickerland is successful because we work with talented designers. And, you know, that never changed because that's what we have been doing from the beginning. The, the humor and all the other aspects like witty and and quirky, what you mentioned, those are all traits from designers. So as a matter of fact, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to define exactly what Kickerland is because as it is an umbrella of so many different designers and each designer is actually its own brand, its own trait, and everybody has something special. And, and that's why you get a very diverse product line. Mm. You know, we are always open-minded and um, we're always looking for something new. (laughs) You've shaped the Kickerland brand over the years. Mm -hmm. And you've also mentioned how working with good designers has shaped it. But are there unintended consequences that it's had on your life? Happy accidents or challenges that have shaped you personally? Yeah, you know, like with every business, most of the time that I work for Kickland has been a lot of fun, but there, of course, some of it is, is not so much fun. Sometimes you have to work very hard and, and uh, or you have to be responsible for products that maybe uh, malfunction or there, there's patent issues. And uh, sometimes it's tough, but you always try to do the right thing and you get through it. You get, you get a little bit wiser and uh, smarter as you go. I'm interested in your character because I I know from you mentioning and also from research that you've always lived on a houseboat and that you pretty much bike to work every day, rain, snow, or shine. Not only does this not fit the stereotype that we all have in our heads of what a businessman is, but it seems way more fun. But it also seems like you don't necessarily need comfort in the way that other people crave it. Am I making an assumption or would you say that that's true? Well, I, I am very comfortable with uh, the way I live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that uh, now the millennials that are young now and just starting to work, they understand it better than some of the people of my age in that way that everybody is always looking for a purpose in, in life. Just like, like our parents that they had to work so hard to reach what they what they have reached and but why are we doing that i think the purpose of doing things is more important than doing whatever you're doing i would agree with that and so then you can imagine what my next question is how would you define your purpose my purpose yeah (laughs) i try to do my best 
And it is nice to get gratification for for things that I've been striving for all my life. But I don't really work for the money. But that sounds like a luxurious thing to say. But I think it's more important that you like what you do and uh, you do things that make sense for this world. I like to have a better world for, for everybody. And I put my little contribution in and at the same time I have a little fun. It was like a pretty good recipe for success. Mm -hmm. Do what you like, <laughs> make your contribution, have a little fun. <laughs> That's right. So what's the future that you envisioned for Kickerland? I mean, you've been around for 25 years. Um, I assume you want it to be around for at least another 25, if not much longer. So you want to talk about what the future holds? Oh, I would like to continue what we're doing. and. Once I was reading a book about a Dutch company, and it's one of the oldest companies in the world, and it was about 600 years old. And the many, many owners that they, they had, that's actually family owned, they said every decision that you make has to um, be for 15 years. So that's probably why they got to be uh, such an old company. But we don't make decisions for every 15 years, but I think it's important to have some long-term thinking. The way the market is uh, changing for companies like Kickerland, I think it's even more important to, um, to give a little bit depth and to show the public, the people that look at us, that we're doing something that is not just for profit, but it's also something that makes sense in this world. And that's why it's important to do things that are also not for profit. Mm. And I'm not sure exactly how to explain <laughs> something like that. Do you want to give back? Yes, you have to. And you have to have a good meaning too. Right. Like we do with the design challenges, that's really good because uh, we help in education, we help uh, young people in the right direction. And uh, it's nice to, uh, to be appreciated for that. So do you have a new project or something in the pipeline that you want our listeners to know about? Yeah, actually there is. A designer came up to me. It's about kids uh, spending so much time inside. And he showed me some, uh, some research that in, uh, in the UK, for example, the uh, average kid under uh, eight years old spends more time inside than the average inmate in jail. <gasps> and That's frightening. Yeah, it is. So everybody's on the iPads or on, on the mobile phones. Yeah. So we, we wanted to um, create products to encourage kids to go outside. For example, in Rotterdam, where, where we have our office, there is a park. It was designed by a German landscape artist where the kids, they can just run around, they can climb the trees, they can jump in the pool, they can do everything they want. And it's really, the kids can get dirty, they can get all in the mud and everything. So we created this line of products called Huckleberry. And we're going to come out with that next year. And it's very interesting, like how to, you get a knife, which is a little bit rounded and... Uh, and with a knife, you can, you can make a bow and arrow, you can make uh, a fishing rod, and you, all kind of things that you can make, sort of encouraging kids to go outside. And I think that's, that's going to be a very interesting project. And no, I don't know if it's going to sell, but we tried to get the kids outside. And yeah, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. It sounds like fun. I want to be, you made me want to be a kid again. I want to make my own bow and arrow and fishing rod <laughs> and getting dirty in the mud. <laughs> that sounds awesome. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's a really good idea to encourage this new generation of kids to make things because there's a lot of stuff nowadays that you can just buy. So there's not as much focus on actually like DIY or making things yourself as kids. Mm -hmm. I do think it activates a center of the brain that it flexes the problem solving muscles at a young age and gets those activated and, and trained. And I think that's really important. And I think whether you go on to be somebody who makes stuff or not, you are better set up for life and have more confidence if you know how to make stuff. I think so too. 
it really stimulates the uh, creativity and uh, you know everybody not only kids we're all so focused in, in looking in screens that sometimes you need a little time off and uh, do exactly not that and just go out and take a walk and enjoy nature and then do things that are like totally unfocused <laughs> yes well, in honor of that, I'm going to do some unfocused stuff right after we're done <laughs> talking. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Where can our listeners find you on the web and social media? You can follow Kickland on uh, Facebook and Instagram. And of course, you can find me at you know, trade shows and everywhere where uh, there is something to do. <laughs> <laughs> and on your houseboat. <laughs> Yes, I'm my houseboat. Or your bike. <laughs> so you can keep up with me. Yeah, I don't know if we can. No, probably not. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not going that fast. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing your whole trajectory with us. It's been fascinating. It's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure, you too. Thank you, Jamie, Amy. He's a fascinating entrepreneur in that he didn't even really seem aware of his own entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, he's, he sort of always just knew it was in his DNA that he wanted to work for himself. But nowadays, people are really focused on creating a business plan, you know, market testing and figuring out how to build the brand. And he just seemed like he was sort of feeling his way the whole time and honing his instincts what he underplayed about his particular skill set is probably his ability to adapt. Because I am guessing that every step of the way, he started learning things about market conditions, about what makes good design, about how to manufacture things. And by the time he bought 200,000 pieces from a factory in China, he probably had a pretty good sense that he could figure out how to sell it, even if he hadn't sold it yet. Yeah. I absolutely love the design challenges with the students. I think that's amazing. And I'm so glad that's such a major part of Kickerland's mission. Yeah, and I do appreciate that he brings a little bit of humor and a little bit of delight to design. He doesn't take it seriously. Like he said, he takes the business seriously, but not the design. And I love that because, you know, after you've walked like, you know, all the aisles of a trade show, sometimes it's just exhausting and everybody takes themselves so seriously and then you come upon this booth where there's like wind up toys and just like <laughs> goofy games that you can play and you know really functional items that are incredibly beautiful but also make you smile and it's really hard to do that successfully and still be well respected in the design field there's a fine line at being kitschy and being like cheesy I agree with you. So what it's really hard to do is do well-designed things that have a bit of humor yes. that don't fall into kitsch or camp. Right. Um, and Kickerland does that really well. And I love what you said about how these everyday products can bring a smile. I think <laughs> we sometimes forget to place an enormous amount of value on that. I have, I mean, it's, I, it, it's a Kickerland extension cord. I have a million extension cords, as you might imagine. Some of those big orange ones and some of those small lamp ones. None of them make me smile. In fact, they all frustrate me, <laughs> except for my Kickerland extension cord. It's cloth covered. It's got like a herringbone pattern on it and I'm proud of it. And when I take it out and plug something into it, it makes me smile. Right. And I think that is enormously valuable. It is. In, a, in an interaction with an object. And you're not uncomfortable, like you feel like you have to hide it because it's actually really pretty too. <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Sign up for our newsletter, read the show notes, and see images of Jan's work at cleverpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast because we love to hear from you guys. This episode of Clever was edited by Chris Modal of Your Studio with music by L1011. 